It's time. It's, it's time. time for technology. Technology after dark. After dark. After dark. Oh, oh my. my. Hey, Chris, you English. Hey, hey, that's the one that all these face, you motherfucker. <laughs> 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 This is the guy the sharks are banking on the selfie. <laughs> <laughs> what that porno esque opening that we had? Are we way, 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 way after dark? Is this Cinemax style that we're going with? Oh, how does that look? So those are the penalties, and when they're explained, look at Joe Thornton explaining what happened, and Henrik doesn't like that. Get that out of my face, Joe Thornton. Yeah, I think they do. Afternoon delight. It's time. For technology. Technology. After dark. After dark. Oh my. Oh my goodness, what a third period that was. Welcome to this edition of Technology After Dark, following a thrilling and stirring 5-3 Sharks victory that concludes a six-game road trip. And they are now officially in first place by themselves in the Pacific Division. I am Eric Kura, otherwise known as PuckGuy14 on Twitter. If you want to be a part of the show, use the hashtag Pucknology After Dark. You can use that to comment or ask questions. You can tweet any of us at Pucknology, at PuckGuy14, at AJ underscore strong, at Eric Landy, at iRead, Pucknology, great handle, at ChrisJWS along with all of our other compadres. All right, with that being said, there we go. Now we got that. We're at 10 now, folks. That's right. The staff is growing and growing. <laughs> all right, with us tonight, uh, we have Eric Landy. Hey, y'all. How you guys doing? Good, good, good. Mr. Ticket Rep himself, A.J. Strong. Oh, please never use that Afternoon Delight intro ever <laughs> again. Well, we're delightful in, in the afternoon right now. No, don't right. ever fucking do it again. <laughs> Ian Reed. Hey, everybody. How you doing? And, of course, the producer of the day, the almighty Chris J.W.S. What's up? All righty. Six in a row. Six and oh on the road trip. Uh, they found a way to win again, and they are now sitting atop the Pacific Division. I will start with uh, Eric. You're only going to come in for a short time. So, uh, Landy, your thoughts tonight. So, yesterday, uh, I had basically gave kind of three different scenarios. One, you could play the game and kind of be let down like we've kind of always seen the Sharks, you know, because they are, you know, off in the sunset already going home. You could uh, maybe say, oh, they played a pretty good game, you know, maybe got a point out of it and, you know, decent, decent ending on the road trip. And then I said they could really gut this out and go for the sweep and really show me something. And, um... Boy, that the first two periods sure looked like they were going to mail it in, but then something amazing happened that I have not seen in a long time. The Sharks team gutted it out, and you had Jamie Baker saying, this team looks like it's coming together and looks like it's playing for each other. Um, really, the block shots by Wingles in the second period, um, the fortitude to keep on pressing and then getting those goals back to back to back, they really showed me something tonight. They showed me that they might have something different here, that something might be starting to break their way. All right. Uh, AJ, good evening to you, sir. Uh, what did you think about today? today, uh, today? Well, um, <laughs> Dylan got the first star, so the apocalypse is clearly upon us. Prepare ourselves right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it's it, there was there was no better way to finish. Obviously, the this roadie. Uh, they definitely looked like they had the jump in the first part of the uh, of the first period, and for most of that first period, and then the second period, they kind of fell into that that lull that we've seen them do over the course of <laughs> most seasons, where the second period they kind of fall into a funk, even though they did get that first goal. And then, as Landy pointed out, yeah, we just saw something remarkable, and it was almost as if the... Uh, we, talk about seeing something that you've never really seen before. The captain of the Sharks taking the team upon his shoulders and saying, we're going to get this done. And I don't know that we've seen that from a captain since Owen Nolan. Yeah, I mean, uh, something, you grab them by the uh, cajones and do something special. All right, uh, Chris, good evening to you, sir. What, have, what did you think about tonight? Uh, I, I thought it seemed like the perfect opportunity for a letdown tonight. You know, everything was really not going their way, back-to-back, -back, sixth game on the road trip. Didn't really need it. I mean, they need every point they can get, but they didn't really have to win this one to have a successful road trip. So they, they could well have packed it in. I was pretty impressed. I was kind of figuring, okay, it's, you know, disappointment. Okay, I guess we'll move on. I mean, I don't think I would have blamed them too hard had they lost that one, but it, they, they showed some real guts. They were able to do it. Really, they, were only, ha they only had three lines tonight on a back-to-back because -back Haley and Brown were completely untrustworthy. Goldobin, not so trustworthy either, and then Wingles was ailing half the game. So... Uh, they they answered the call. They show they showed me something. I'd like to see more of that because that that was pretty impressive actually. And for uh, what for two minutes we saw essentially an entire line in the box in the first period. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which wasn't that different from the rest of the game except for yeah. <laughs> yeah, instead of being on the bench, they were in the box, but it was essentially the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it, it's funny we kind of bagged on Goldobin, but he had ten minutes ice time, so that's not bad. Yeah. Yep. Uh, good he evening. Be oh, I was gonna say good evening to you, Ian. Uh, I was Hello. gonna, I was just gonna have you uh, ch join in on the combo. Yeah. Um. I mean, you know, kind of echoing what everyone else has said, they, they could have lost this game, and you know, you'd be disappointed. But I don't think anyone would have been too upset about it. It, it just, it would have been what it was. You know, like they, they had a successful road trip, no matter which way you sliced it, and. Doing, you know, what they did tonight was awesome. It was great to see because they didn't have to. We would have, you know, we wouldn't have liked it. We would have all got over it pretty quick, I think. Yeah, no, it definitely set up as a, as a game that that could have, uh, you know, gone one way and, and you could have lost it and be like, well, you know what, net positive. But really, just really gutted it out. Yeah, right before that uh, goal to make it, three to two, I was already kind of like, okay, preparing my um, let's not overreact, folks. Like, it's one game. You know, I was already kind of thinking that's what we're going to have to go with tonight, but it, it, it was good It was good not to have to go with that. And, yeah, first 6-0 roadie in Sharks history. And it's yeah. uh, Pachelka is tweeting out now that the tri apparently the tryout went well and Zubris is on the plane to San Jose. Uh, can't say that that's, you know, when, you, when your competition is Lurg and Haley and the head coach already is the one that was fighting for you to be on the team, yeah, I think we all thought that was kind of fate complete at that point. Well, yeah, I mean, really, they were forced to play Haley and Brown on a second half of back-to-back. -back like I said, they only had three lines tonight, really, because mm -hmm. those two combined for less minutes than Goldobin did. Goldobin had the third least amount of minutes among forwards, and those two combined had less than him. So you can see... They are not trusted by the coaching staff, and when you can't have that in back-to-backs, like they got away with it this time, but they need they need more forward depth than that, where they can actually put guys out there that they can trust to play more than three or four minutes. Right, and and if you're gonna play journeyman, let's play NHL journeyman and not AHL journeyman. Like, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm fine with this. And yeah. if we're gonna play NHL journeyman, can we please play guys who have skill, not are just face mashers? Because honestly, right. yeah. No, totally. I and it makes sense. I mean, hopefully Zubers can be that guy to, you know, be a, th a little bit of a thumper, but also contribute offensively uh, without any uh, defensive lagging. Um, guys, Alex Stalock started tonight. There was some hesitation among among the Sharks fam about the uh, about him starting rather than have 
Jones go out for the entire 6 and 0 sweep. Uh, I'll start with uh, AJ. What did you think about Staylock tonight? I have no problems with Staylock. <laughs> <laughs> he was oh. perfect in every possible way to suggest otherwise. Yeah, he was he was guns a blazing on Twitter, but that's all he had to say when it. <laughs> when it but, you know, it's just, just, look, I get it. I mean, I understood the 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 you know the, the some of the tweets that were happening where especially when the sharks went down then it was why didn't they play the hot hand uh, you know the all the same stuff we always see every time a backup starts when the team was rolling with their starter uh, it's, you have to stay like gonna have to get games here and there i mean that's just the way it is you have to play your backup every once in a while you show me the goalie that go that plays 82 games you know, and 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 also let's let's talk about too the the quote that we hear that we've heard for everybody, whether it's been Niemi, whether it's been Nabokov, whether it's been Shields. Who I mean, just name a name a goalie that has it said by the coach. Oh, he actually plays better when he gets fewer starts. You know, you never hear that. It's always at the oh, well they play better the more starts they get. Blah, blah, blah. And it, okay, fine, whatever. But, but you're not gonna have a goalie that's gonna play 82 goddamn games. You're gonna have to get a guy, your backup in there. And of course, you're gonna play him against uh, a team that is probably gonna be on the on the end of a back to back, and it's gonna be against the the lower of the two teams. Let I mean, honestly, who did you want Staylock to face? Did you want him to face Pittsburgh? Did you want him to face Columbus? Obviously, you want him to do Columbus. And hey, the fi- they finally gotten over the Columbus curse. Uh, they were, what, 7-1-1 one, and one up until over the last night until tonight? Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, did he over- Did Staylock overcommit on a goal? Sure, fine. But let's be honest. This was just a weird goddamn game. When Brendan fucking Dillon gets the game-winning <laughs> goal, I mean, it was just it's it was just a you know it's just a weird game, but hey, they got the win. They made uh, you know some franchise history tonight, and that's really all that matters. So we'll we'll see Jones on a Wednesday night. Uh, I think most Sharks fans would prefer if this game was in Chicago, but unfortunately, they do yeah. have to play 41 at home. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just the way it is right now. And they have to uh, wear teal. They can't wear the white jerseys. Uh, speaking of Brendan Dillon, of course, I think his biggest fan in San Jose is Rocket Backhander, uh, to which she tweeted, I so want to make that guy a big steak dinner right now. <laughs> 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 which I, I hope it's a, it's a nice one, maybe with some sautéed mushrooms and onions on it. Um, but definitely guys, have to be T-Bone. De- definitely have to be T-Bone. Oh, see, I would have gone filet mignon. Well, no, you have the filet and the New York strip, right? Oh. That's the T bone. Oh. Yes. Hello. There we I might. Hello. Ah, but uh, I mean, how much? How many more starts do you think Staylock would get uh, down the road here? I mean, yeah, Jones has obviously made himself the number one guy, but uh, you've got to give him some time. You got to give him some rest. I mean, like, you can't have him go what seventy-eight games. Well, yeah. we talked. We talked about it uh, last time. Was we do, ha- you know, after next week, you have three consecutive weeks coming up to start December, where each week features a back to back. So, I mean, there at least there's opportunity there. I, I would say it should be a rare back to back where you have Jones starting both. I, I mean, yeah. at the very least, but Staley should be getting in on those back to backs as often as possible, unless we find ourselves maybe end of the season in a tight chase and they want to play Jones more often and maybe pick their spots more. But they – they I, I couldn't agree with AJ Moore here, actually. They need to make sure Staylock gets in the rotation, if only to not wear out Jones, because we need Jones good in April and May, not just good in November and December. So that's – I would say that's very important. And Staylock, he was – honestly, he was a lot like the rest of the team tonight. Had some bad spots, but played pretty good – Overall, and when it mattered, he made the saves. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not very interesting tonight. Cause I'm doing a lot of agreeing, but you know, I didn't like that second goal. I thought he ridiculously overplayed it. But aside from that, I mean, you know, you got to start Staylock. You have a back-to-back. You start Staylock. You, there's no reason that we needed Jones to start this game. None. We're at a decent point in the standings, the wins aren't that super crucial yet. You could have easily chalked this up as a, you know, a solid road trip with a five and one record. 
you know, getting six and zero is the, the icing on the cake, and you you have to you have to play Staylock. You can't just not play him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anything over sixty two games for Martin Jones is too much, way too much. I mean, we saw what McClellan would do with Niemi and and burn him out. And I don't want that for Jones, you know. I mean, Jones is a little bit bigger, and, and he's going to be um, hopefully have a little bit more endurance than Niemi did. But still, you can't play him more than 60-some-odd games. So you're going to have to get Staylock in somehow. Yeah, I mean, well, there's, there's been analysis done of, like, goalies who play a ton of games, and it's been shown you don't want to really go over 60, 65. That's the magic number where a goalie's performance starts to decline, and they can actually measure that in the numbers. So... We want to make sure Staylock gets in those starts. You know, you love him or hate him, it's a it's a fact. We can't wear out Jones too early. Well, we t- I mean the they pointed that out a while back when they would we'd hear that that tried and true line of oh this such and such goalie plays better the more starts that he sees, blah blah blah. Then if I remember correctly, they looked at the numbers over Nabby's career and Nabby actually. Got, had like his best numbers when he was splitting time with Toscala. So, you know. Yeah, it, you know, it's not surprising. Numbers. And there are exceptions to that. I mean, you can play a ton of games and still have a great end of your season. It's not like a guarantee, but more likely than not, if you play a crap load of games, you're probably going to see small declines in performance towards the end of the year as you get tired. Now, does anybody have any information on what's going on with Nieto, why he wasn't in? I know it said not a healthy scratch, but nobody had any information as to upper body, lower body, you know, uh, abscess, tooth, who knows? Uh, nothing offhand. I I know they had mentioned it on on the pregame show on KFOX that, that he was out, that um, it was some sort of bump and bruise, but it was from last night's game that, that he sat out. Um, you know... Tommy Wingles took a couple of block shots in the middle frame of that game, and he sat out a couple or a few shifts. Uh, it was nice to see him back for the third period, but you got to wonder how how healthy he is at the moment. Yeah, I think um, Tommy went in with six minutes left in the second period. Uh, you know, we didn't see him out until the third. Um, looked like he was skating okay, so you know it's probably going to be like you know, bruised thigh or, you know, um, Mm -hmm. bruised ankle or something like that. You know, I don't, I don't see it more than that, um, being more than that. And, you know, they'll have, what is it? We'll have Monday and you'll have Tuesday as a recovery day before Blackhawks. So I think, I think both should be okay. You know, if it was a major injury, I would have thought you'd see a call up or something. Yeah, especially well, also, a call up though they can Zubers. wait on because I mean a call up is just paperwork when you're when we're heading back to San Jose, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, nothing right away as we speak. They can wait till Wednesday if they wanted to. Yeah, I mean there's there's no flights involved or anything like that. I mean maybe a little travel if they're like I don't know what the Barracuda schedule is, but yeah, it should be minimal. It's just pretty much a hey, we're moving this guy. So guys, where are we penciling in Zubris? Fourth line. Fourth, Fourth line. line. To replace, like we, we just need someone who can give us more than four or five minutes a night down there. If he can just give us seven or eight and contribute something, at least net, you know, have it be, have at least break even when he's out there and not bleed shots to the opposition. So you're looking well, I mean, at like, Tierney, Tierney, Zubris, and Nieto then? I, I would probably yeah. say that for for against a skill lineup, and I think maybe for a, a bruiser lineup, you put. Um, Brown in instead of Nieto, in my opinion. What about putting him on the third line, though, with with Wingles and Hurdle, since he does have a little bit of the scoring touch? I like Donskoy, though, with yeah. Hurdle and Wingles, because Donskoy really does a lot of the footwork. You have Hurdle with a little bit of dynamic um, playmaking ability, and you have Wingles. I know he's, he's in it tough right now, but he's definitely drawing a lot of penalties, so... You know, I, I like that chemistry of that third line to me. I'm actually and enjoying I, the chemistry of the second line right now. Yeah, uh, I would say you just kind of slot him in wherever you feel on a given night. Like, I mean, it, it could be it could be different depending on what your matchups are. Because you know, if you're, sure. it, I mean, it depends a lot on your game plan. Because you know, who who you want to match, which lines you want to match up against the opposing top lines, what who, who and where you're going to try to match your bottom lines against, and all that. So maybe some nights he's in, Mason might he's out. 
I would definitely, honestly, I would not scratch Nieto for Brown ever. Sorry, Eric. No, I mean, <laughs> it, like, let's say let's say you're playing, um, I don't know, like Philadelphia again, or you know, a team like that that's got a little bit more of a traditional checking line fourth fourth line. I, I still think you want Brown as a as a bruiser. So um, what you do with those lines is you score on them because they're stupid and they can't do anything other than just hit people. <laughs> I, I I think this is where philosophically we will disagree quite a bit because I think that the fourth line should be more fluid. It should depend on who you're playing and, and not be set in stone as a checking line. So when you're playing against the Blackhawks, you put Nieto and you have Zuberus. When you're playing against a team like... Philadelphia, or you're playing a team like Nashville, or you know somebody who's got a lot of, you know, a, a lot of guys that can hit. You want somebody at least to to play that role. I, I see where you're coming from, but here's the thing: I believe you should dictate to the other team the game being played, and not the other way around. Yeah, but I'm just so tired of Nieto getting pushed around in the forecheck. You know, every time he goes out on the forecheck, he's got two defensemen coming down on him, and he's always pushed off the puck. And you see that with Tierney a little bit, too. And you can't have that on the fourth line when you've got 6'4", 220-pound guys on you. You just can't. We should also, just for, for those that are watching, uh, just in case, and that they weren't aware, <laughs> and, and are kind of going... What the hell happened to post game on CSN and <laughs> with Brody and everything? And just to let you guys know, if you weren't aware that uh, Brody and the crew they got bumped for 49ers post game and Warriors pregame because I guess CSN only has two studios, and so of course because the Sharks are the low man on the totem pole, they get bumped. So just letting you know. Yeah, uh, nice. we nice. did have we did have a question. Uh, we also had a bit of lunacy from Jake, who usually tries to bring something to the party, but has just said trade Nieto for John Scott. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, the, Com completely agree. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, that that right there is a uh, a topic for a false dichotomy, if there ever was one. Um, but the question at hand: now that we've seen this, because we and we've debated this ad nauseum, but now that we've seen the Sharks do this on the road, this incredible historic six-game road trip, coming back, uh, well, obviously there are games to be played on Monday and Tuesday, but at least at this point in time, coming back to San Jose first in the Pacific, do the Sharks still will... out against Chicago okay. on Wednesday night, and I think just based on, I don't even know that the sellout has a whole lot to do with it, but historically the Sharks, from what I remember, from the games that I've gone to, Wednesdays, uh, the Wednesday night game before Thanksgiving is almost an automatic sellout, and especially when you've got the Blackhawks coming to town. And we haven't we played the Blackhawks like the Wednesday before Thanksgiving several times as well. I, I <laughs> really, really, we went over this a couple a couple. Yeah, it's like, it's either it's either uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas. It's I, one I remember a really it's, bad it's one from like 2009 where like that that one just went so badly. It was like the first three Blackhawks goals were all shorthanded. But yeah, uh, and then six, there was tw six of the last nine, I believe. Six of the last nine Thanksgiving games we have hosted Chicago. I don't know why we we had talked about that. I mentioned it to to Kura saying, you know, what the hell does the United Air? <laughs> what is going on in Chicago every fucking Wednesday before Thanksgiving that the, <laughs> that the Hawks are not available, or maybe it's just a big thing that the Bulls have a big thing at home on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Who knows? Okay, I don't All know. right. Well, so, no, I, 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 I got the answer. I got the answer here. It's the, what the Hawks call the circus road trip. Uh, that's when Ringling Brothers, Barnum Bailey, uh, take over the place, and they're there from the 19th to the 29th. Ah, okay, that that makes sense. I know San Antonio has something similar in the NBA. Uh, as far as saying it's an automatic sellout, the thing is, though, almost every game was an automatic sellout for, like, the last seven or eight years. So I, I don't know if I'd call this one an automatic sellout based on history because, really, we're, we're unfortunately, we're making history right in about now this year with the way sellout, you know, lack of sellouts have gone. All right. Well, let me uh, let me just finish off a, a quick thought, and then I, I got a boogie. Um, for me, this team has shown great resiliency. This team 
uh, really has kind of opened my eyes to what they can do, and uh, I feel like it was a statement game. I felt like it was a statement that, hey, you know what? We can dig down deep, and, and we've got the ability to do it, and it, you know, it, it restored a little bit of faith for me, because they could have went out there and dropped it after 3-1, and they didn't, so. And it really felt like it started with Pavelski. Yeah, yeah, the captain, the captain leads the way, so anyways, guys, good night, and uh, I will see you on the, uh, on the Wednesday cast. All right, Landy, thank easy, you man. so much. You will see him on Wednesday night. It will be exclusively Pucknology After Dark as your only post-game show because it's Wednesday Night Rivalry, the night you love to hate. Uh -oh. at, least, at least this one's an actual rivalry for once. I mean, you know... Really? Uh, no, I mean, there, there, is, there is some rivalry there between Chicago and Sharks. Unfortunately, the Sharks got the worst end of it for the most part, but... There's a, there's at least history there. There's playoffs. There's a couple years there where they're both top tier teams. So it's I mean okay versus Sharks versus Nashville. That yeah no I'll give you that rivalry. Well, there's, see, there's a I lot, don't know. There's a lot more. There's a lot more history between them and the Blackhawks. And I'm talking recent history, not talking like eight or nine years ago history. I'm talking the last five years. Yeah. Still, it doesn't, you know, when it when it when it's quote unquote rivalry night. I don't know. I, Chicago is definitely not one of like the first five teams I would think about, but I don't I, know. I, but I, I would understand name ahead of them: Vancouver Ducks, Kings. Uh, I'd even consider uh, Detroit. I'd put Detroit in there. I'd consider. I'd maybe consider Dallas. It's just when I just think of overall rivalries. I mean, if you want to, if you want to, you know, batten it down to okay, last five years. Then yeah okay Chicago maybe gets in as the fifth but I'm just uh, you know I just think of it, it's kind of like the Niners and the Cowboys haven't had a rivalry in forever yet when you think rivals I mean Jesus Christ Jerry Rice is wearing a Cowboys you know jersey in a commercial so oh, there's God, clear it's God, that it, but it's that but you understand it's that rivalry history that that is evoked oh, by that that's God. what I think is so funny is that when Niner fans whether it's being stoked by the local media about the whole thing about the Niners versus the Raiders or the Niners versus the Seahawks yeah there's some rivalry obviously now between the Niners and the Seahawks now that they're in division and they're actually a decent team but it's like when you think historically the rival, most Niner fans are gonna the first thing out of their mouths is gonna be no Cowboys number one with that, and it's and it's really not even up for debate. I don't oh. even I don't understand why people even bring up the Raiders. I, I think it's a combination of both history and recent history. I mean, recent history to me to like tell you all how to rivalries. I mean, the Niners and the Cowboys rivalry has been cold forever, but it's it's always gonna be there. Yeah, but like if you're talking like hot in the hot rival rules in the moment. You know, I'd say like the last five years or recent history or you know core. If you're talking about core teams playing, because you know, like if a team blows itself up and is no longer the same team anymore, I, I at that point kind of their other rivalries, unless it gets reignited to me, are kind of like they're they go cold for a while. I mean, you know, just it depends on how you want to find it. But to me, Blackhawks fit the definition a lot closer than <laughs> the Predator. <laughs> Or some of these other teams that we've seen on there. I mean, really, the main ones we should be playing on there is the Kings, the Ducks, and then Vancouver, I guess. But Maybe I, it, it's, it's closer. Die. It's closer. And yeah, there's the Calgary rivalry for a while in the 2000s there, which hasn't really been much of a thing lately. But yeah. Uh, and we would just also like to welcome those of you who are watching the Niners get their asses handed to themselves to Pucknology After Dark. Um, just in case anybody wanted to join us instead of listening. We've been having some streaming issues with YouTube, so we apologize for the inconvenience, but we are back. Uh, join us right now on this um, feed, and uh, we will... <laughs> As I'm looking at AJ's tweet, the silver lining of technology... After our free fuck guy 14. Yes! <laughs> I love that, it. That right there is the is the <laughs> Pucknology After Dark freezing. That right there is that's that's it in a, in a single image. Pretty much. Pretty much. But we are back. Uh, all right, so guys, 
let's um, go back to what we were talking about the la for the last 10 minutes before we realized we were just repeating ourselves. Um, what do you think now going forward with uh, this team uh, besides, uh, well, AJ, you have the tweets of the night. Apparently, we should just stay out on the road, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be uh, the the cure to everything that ails the Sharks is to just keep continue playing on the road. Uh, it's it's the case that we've um, we've bandied about before is they just need to get it together at home and figure out what is going on with the special teams at home. If you look at at the losses that they've uh, taken in at home. A power play goal, a PK here, uh, you know, a power play there could have been a massive difference. Could have been, uh, you know, instead of having a losing record, could have at least been 500. So I think going forward, um, you have to be, I think we're all optimistic. We're going to see Couture back. We're going to get Torres back. Uh, it could be interesting to see what happens with Zubris. But if we have our you know, quote-unquote hashtag full squad, um, and we just dial in the special teams, I, you know, I'm optimistic. I could see them finishing uh, at least second in the Pacific. And, hey, you know, maybe it, it comes around, and, and what we saw, what we were all excited about at the beginning of October, uh, maybe that comes to fruition. Uh, no one is running away with this division right now. And I, I think we would all agree that this is the time that the Sharks should really take advantage of that. Put, you know, bank bank points. I'm going to pull out AJ's favorite and just go a small sample size. <laughs> eight game, I mean, it, it's eight games at home. They went three and five. That, I mean, it's it's hard to extrapolate too much from that. That is a relatively, you know, small amount of games. I mean, they played almost as many games on this road trip as they have at home in total. So I, I think we'll get a better idea once they have some extended home time. And I don't see many ways that it doesn't get better because it's exactly. easier to play at home in so many ways. And rare is the team that is better on the road than it is at home. And usually the ones that are better on the road that are in, than at home are usually, like, great at both. So it, it's I don't see many ways it stays that way. It just seems... It would be quite an anomaly if they say great on the road and bad on bad on home ice. I, I think it will correct itself. I think you know they'll see more you know enough time. They'll see enough bounces go their way. They'll I think they get the special teams right. I, I don't see a reason why they can't do it at home. Uh, I, I just I just don't see it continuing that way. Mm -hmm. Eric. Uh, yeah, I mean it's just a matter of time and kind of. You know, going off of the off of the subject a little bit, is when Couture gets back, and when Torres gets back, you have um, you have to make room for where am I looking at here? Uh, Torres two million, uh, and Couture is at six. You're you're needing to free up eight million dollars of cap space, and if you do you sign Zutio? Uh, I'm hoping that it's just uh, a, 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 right now they're at 4.815 million in cap space. Um, so they'll be needing to make some moves and will be very tight against the cap uh, when, when uh, Logan gets back. Yeah, and um, I'm going to be interested to see what uh, Zubris brings to the party and against the cap. Uh, on on the Twitter machine, our favorite uh, Slushy Jake, who did in fact call 6-0 and on the road trip, pulled that one out of his butt. Yeah, um, nice job. He's, uh, he's calling uh, for, well, I think we'd all agree that uh, the top line obviously remains the same with uh, Pavs, Thornton, and, and Carlson. Um, then, of course, Ward. Uh, well, see, now here's where he's a little out to lunch. He's saying Ward and Marlowe being centered by Hurdle, and then Couture cent centering Wingles and Donskoy, and then Zubris, Tierney, and Nieto. Now, there's no, there's no freaking way that Hurdle is going to be centering the second line when that's long been Couture's spot and when Marlowe has shown 
since Couture has been out, what he can do there. So I, that I think, yeah, that's so not happening. Well, and and I think also, I mean, the way we've had it, the way McClellan is always, or sorry, yeah, Tom McClellan, and then now DeBoer seems to have been using that second line is in that um, intense top forward opposing role. So I I don't see them shuffling it like that. I I think it's most likely you see Marlowe and Kutcher and probably Ward continue to draw those hard matchups they were early in the season and try and at least break even with opposing top liners. So that you know that way. You can keep the the Joes playing so, some softer minutes, but being able to create some offense, keep the maybe have the the Wingles line be the one that kind of grinds out as the third line because you know he's more he's more physical, and then the fourth line just don't don't screw up. <laughs> that's that's the main thing we need from our fourth line. Don't you know eat some minutes, but don't don't cause problems. Yeah, uh, and I think we're all bummed too that Tierney is not. It's it's what we've said before, even last season, is that you you get so bummed when you're looking at a guy with that much talent be anchored down by the likes of whether it's uh, you know, Brown, Haley, Lurg, John Scott, pick your poison. But the fact that we keep anchoring that you know, that last guy, and are we ever? It's funny that we've talked about getting back Couture, getting back Torres. We haven't said a word about Ben Smith. Yeah. Honestly, what is there to say? Yeah, but and, it's it's somebody else who's who's on the uh, who you know who's eating up cap space. Right, and that's that's going to become a big issue once uh, Logan and Torres get back. I mean, they combine for eight million dollars. The Sharks are at four point eight with room that they have right now, and if you sign Zubris. Your what the minimum is what six hundred thousand? Uh, is that for a vet or is yeah, that for a vet? Uh, is like six or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. So uh, you have to uh, you have to be concerned about it uh, of, of what you're going to do unless there is a deal in the works for somebody for like a pick. I mean, unless they're going to trade Nieto for somebody um, or or. Well, Nieto has a pretty small cap like number, if I recall correctly. Like, the, the guys who are, like, eating yeah, some of the insane. most amount of cap versus production are guys like Dylan and um, i trying to think who else. There's only a handful of guys that really are, like, underproducing for what they're earning now. Well, I think we would agree that Dylan is definitely there. Braun, I would have said, but Braun seems to be trending upward. I still would would debate that he is uh, overpaid for uh, his slot on the team, especially when compared to other teams. But I know D- Dylan is definitely the overpaid guy on the totem pole right now. Braun, we've seen produce in a Sharks uniform. Braun, mm-hmm. I mean, really, if if he can get anywhere near his that level of production he had it like two years ago, he's a bargain. Like, yeah. <laughs> like so that, that's, what, that's what we need. So we, we know we know we've seen that from him. Dylan's kind of the guy like we've never really seen him in a Sharks uniform earn that paycheck. Like what I see of him in Dallas looks like, you know, there's promise there. It's just we haven't seen that get realized at all yet. Yeah, and, that's and speaking, in the consistency. And speaking of Dallas, how much does it hurt right now that that the Sharks kept? One point one nine million dollars of the MERS salary because that right there would add a complete uh, probably about an even six million dollars uh, for them where they would have a little more room to to play around with. Sure, I, mean, I would assume Goldobin would go down. I'm sure Haley would go down. That's another one point four. So you will get Couture back, okay? But when when Rafi gets back, that's where you're gonna have uh, some issues, and you're, and it's going to make making any move for a trade really tight. Well, and that's why I'm kind of doubting, or I'm, I understand, I guess, to a certain extent, why they're looking at Zubris, and clearly DeBoer has something going on with the guy that it's, you know, this is a guy he thinks can really provide something, even at the minimum. That's okay. That that's great, and, and especially if. If you can have Zubris rather than Lurg or Haley, yeah, you take that at this point. But I'm just worried about when everybody's healthy. You're going to have to some some bodies. We're there's just not enough spaces. You know what I mean? So, and then I pair that with the fact that this defense 
goes off a cliff after the top four. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing, though. When you keep saying, you know, when everyone's healthy, we haven't really seen that yet, so... That's that's going to be a good problem to have, really, mm-hmm. when you're thinking about it. So I, I know it is a, it is potentially a problem, but let's worry about that really when that comes up because so far it just seems like every time we think like, okay, we're done having guys get injured, we get someone else, you know, now Matt Nieto's a mysterious injury. We had Melko Carlson out with a mysterious injury for a while there. You know, Couture's out. Horizel suspended. It just seems like we're not catching many breaks from this. So, I mean, I, I think, I think it, would have, it would take some wizardry maybe to get, you know, manipulate. some guys go to the AHL, some guys might up getting cut. I, I, I really honestly wonder if they do cut ties with Rafi Torres, actually, when the suspension is over. I, I, I've wondered Ooh. about that, which, I mean, I don't, I don't know how that would arrange cap-wise. I know there's usually a couple different ways you can arrange those things just based on how you do it, but... That wouldn't surprise me, honestly, if there's a way that they could do it by doing that. I, I wouldn't be shocked. And Jake, Jake is telling us that we're too that you and I, Chris, are too high on Braun, and uh, he was only good because of Vlasic, and he sucked when he wasn't with them last year. Um. Well, yeah, most of his best minutes were with Vlasic, but he's currently with Vlasic. Yeah, and he's I mean, who else been with Vlasic. Put him so if it was just magically Vlasic making him better, why ain't he better? Like he's okay. Here's the thing also, Vlasic struggles when he's not with a puck mover. Look at his numbers when he's not playing with someone like Dan Boyle or Braun. Braun, for all his detriments, he can move the puck up the ice and make those breakout passes. Um, I guess you could say if we're calling him a top two defenseman, yeah, we're probably overvaluing him. Top oh, four, yeah. I, I think he's definitely capable of being a top four guy. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely a top four, top two borderline if but can be. The same thing with Burns. He can be a, a top flight defenseman, but he, he has to have the right guy with him. And thank goodness DW you know, did his free agency magic for once and, and got a guy that, that works very well with Burns. Um, because that's reaping rewards right now. For sure. Yeah, um, and we can give him credit one more time. And I know Ian or um sorry, it was uh, was it those getting on us? Oh, was, uh, Generation X was getting on us about giving Wilson an A. But <laughs> he's, he had a good, I mean, in this one off season, he had a damn good off season. I mean, yeah. and we aren't even talking that much about Donskoy, who was pretty good today outside of that one mishandling of the puck between him, Burns, and Martin that led to the, I think it was third goal. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, I, and we've discussed this too, is that I think Donskoy is kind of, he's getting seasoning, sort of, and that, like, he's just trying to find his chemistry right now, but I'm telling you, I think by, uh, I feel like by the halfway point, that guy's really going to start putting it all together, he's going to find chemistry, he's going to, and he'll be on a regular line, I mean, we've seen him on the top line, we've seen him on the second line, the third line, I mean, he's been moved around, he's kind of been that, that uh, utility guy. And I think once he's dialed in and feels comfortable and has regular time with, with the same guys, I think we could really see um, some some nice production from him, especially if he ends up being uh, slotted on the third line. I mean, you could picture Hurdle, Donskoy, and Wingles. That could be a lot of fun to watch. Oh, big time. Um, I think Slushy Jake also was suggesting keep moving Hurdle back up into the second line and then having uh, Couture on the third line. Unless Couture needs to be eased in, I see no reason to do that. But then who, I mean, who do you match, as the opponent, who do you match up with? You'll have Thornton and Pavelski on the top line. You'll have Hurdle and Marlowe with Ward uh, on the second line. And then you'll have Couture centering, what, Wingles and Donskoy? And then you have Tierney centering uh, the likes of, well, eventually Rafi Torres, perhaps, along with uh, Zubris and Mike Brown or Matt, Dina, the, the, Matt Nieto. Oh, hold on, but who did you have on the second line with that? With that? that this was from... Um, Hurdle, yeah, Ward, Marlowe. Yeah, but he has Hurdle centering that line. Right. Yeah, I... Mm. 
I don't know. Yeah, no. You want you want Kutcher there because, as I said before, that's our that's our hard matchup line. That's our line that we're gonna try and throw against opposing top forwards. And I don't. I mean, I like the idea of the center depth, but why not have Hurdle be that third line center and let him kind of move up in the Pavelski mold? Because I mean, that's where Pavelski cut his teeth for years was centering that third line and really getting good. And, and then, didn't Couture you know, do the same? Yeah, Couture, Couture did something similar. I mean, they they both paid their dues, and I think that's kind of the role. I think Hurdle's kind of in a all healthy situation. I think that's the role you want Hurdle to play to have that third line position where he's not getting super hard minutes. He's getting a chance to really come into his own right there, not have the hardest matchups, but still be expected to be productive without having the pressure of being you know a top line guy and then fill in in the top lines as needed. You know, kind of be your nine guy swing man, you know, the way Pathalski was for a long time, you know, where he could be your th- third line center or you could swing him up into the top six as you needed to. Mm-hmm. But the thing is is that we have options. I, I think that's that's a great part. And, and if they are building the chemistry fairly well, um and then that they can, you know, gel with everybody on the bottom nine, then I think we're in uh we're in good shape. I well, mean, and, and I, we talked about that we hadn't mentioned Ben Smith. We also haven't even mentioned Barkley Goodrow. Yes. Now, here's my thinking. Does Barkley come into play once Logan gets back, mainly because of uh, cap issues? Hmm. I mean, yeah, but there's, I mean, there's a handful of different ways you could do where, I mean, I assume it's going to involve a lot of guys going down at the AHL, and maybe we could cut ties with a few... Um, Mashers. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, because we we've as we've talked about what lines we would, uh, you know, if we're talking about as we had stated uh, the lines that we've that we essentially have right now, uh, the the top line that we have, uh, the the middle line that we would normally have, uh, you know, Marlow, uh, Couture, Ward, and then the third line consisting of if your top uh, nine is essentially what we have, and then Wingles, Hurdle, and Donskoy. Your bottom, you're talking a combination of, I mean, just throw out these names. I mean, Goodrow, Tierney, Torres, Goldobin, Brown, Smith. I mean, there's just an overflow once everybody else is healthy. And what has always been my biggest pet peeve is I wish we had this problem on defense. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, because, I mean, maybe if they get in that situation, maybe that's when they do try to swing a deal and see if they can get a, you know, swing a few, drop a few of those guys for maybe a fifth, or a fifth, sixth defenseman type person. Because, like I said, the drop-off after the fourth D-man is pretty dramatic. I mean, we talk about how they don't trust the fourth liners. They don't seem to trust the the last pairing that much either. I mean, they're they're taxing Vlasic, Braun, and Burns pretty heavily. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That and that's what makes me nervous is just burning out those top four guys. It's it, especially Vlasic and and uh, Burns. And look at what happened last season when Vlasic went out in the playoffs. I mean, just house of cards. And you we you have to have more depth on on defense right now. Absolutely, and again, like we were mentioning a couple of shows ago, um, it's great that we're looking for help and depth positions on forward, but we also need to find some depth health in in the bottom third pairing for uh, for the defensive pairs. Yeah, I mean, my nightmare is one of the top three defensemen going down with an injury. That's just my nightmare. Because I don't think they're just they have any replacement or any answer for that problem. Yeah, and, and that's what's gonna that's what could be the kryptonite is uh, some idiot and I won't mention their names. Dustin Brown uh, would be stupid to you know throw an elbow or something uh, such into causing an injury, and that's that's not gonna be a good thing for this team. That that could be going on a good run right now. And especially um, if, since you look at the history. All you have to do is look at, oh, how did they you know, end up getting hung out to dry? The, oh, that's right, they, Vlasic was out, and then everything went down the crapper. 
Yeah. So and, and that's that's the whole point. What I think was with the that's not that unusual on. though. And I mean, most teams you take out what's arguably their best defenseman, they're going to have a lot of problems. Well, Chicago didn't have too much with Duncan no. Keith being out. They're they're a pretty, they're one of the few exceptions to that. Okay, but I'm just saying false dichotomy and all. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying like every, but I'm saying like you know probably 28 out of 30 teams you take out their top one or two guy. They're going to struggle. It's going to vary how much, but most teams are going to have a hard time adjusting. Like Chicago, I mean, sheesh, they are like the a defenseman factory over there with just how. God, I wish we had not that not just defensemen, but yeah, defensemen forwards. I mean, like look at who was on the top line tonight. Friggin' Brandon Saad, who was a fourth liner on Chicago, like two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they they just have a gross amount of riches, and I, I'd like to see what the heck they're doing in their farm system that seems to produce so many good guys. Well, uh, speaking of Chicago, mm -hmm. Eric, who will we play next? We play Chicago! Of course! On Wednesday Night Rivalry, I don't remember if our discussion of that was caught on that little blip where we weren't really broadcasting well, but whichever way. But um, yes, it is Wednesday Night Rivalry, um, what is Chicago's record right now? So I think they're they're doing pretty well this year. Uh, over, overall, oh, they're five three and two in their last ten, and they have twenty four points. So actually, if they're the in the, better, if they, if they're in the if they're in the Pacific, they'd actually be in the second or third place here. Yeah, they would uh, have uh, twenty four points with eleven rows. So. Uh, they would be, yeah, they would be, uh, they would be in third. They'd be in third LA. as a game of hand. So yeah, if they're they're doing, they're in the central, which is pretty brutal. So uh, I wouldn't judge them too much based on their record. Yeah, uh, right now the Sharks are the hottest team in the league. They've they have the longest current streak right now at six. Uh, it the game will be at seven o'clock. Let, let's be honest here. There's another game before the Sharks and Blackhawks on NBCSN at 4:30. Oh my God. How how this usually happens, and you guys can say it with me. Of course, it goes into a shootout. Um, For me, it's not even that. It's it's just the fact. I mean, yeah, have we seen it several times that these Wednesday night rivalry games, that for some godforsaken reason, they. Uh, can't get the second game off in time, whether the first game goes to OT, goes to a shootout, or just has a ridiculous amount of penalties calls, called that keeps slowing the game down. The yeah. fact of the matter is, there for me, there is no excuse to not be starting the early game a half an hour earlier. Starting those at, at 4.30, giving yourself a two-and-a-half-hour window when... The vast majority, I would I would venture to say probably 85 to 90 percent of hockey games go longer than two and a half hours. It's very rare to get a game in you know two and a half hours or less. So just start the game a half an hour early. If you have to fill or vamp for an extra 10 or 12 minutes uh, on the guys on the post game or leading into the next game, I think that's probably within their uh, wheelhouse that they can probably get that done rather than pissing off fan bases by constantly going to the late game and missing the first two to three to five minutes. I mean, didn't we see them last season go to a, a Sharks game late and it was already like one nothing? I think it was yeah, even two nothing. But again, like remember, they don't care. They really don't care about us over here. The, their bread is buttered in the uh, NBC division over there on the East Coast. Yeah, but Chicago's they, they a big really draw. But Chicago's a pretty big draw. You know, you would figure that, I mean, defending champs and, you know, th what, three cups in five seasons, six seasons, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, you would think that that's going to be a pretty good draw. Uh, yeah, but that, I, if I'm a Chicago an fan, I'm That's an exception, off. though. That's an yeah. exception, though, because, like, but, most of the time we're talking about King Sharks yeah. or, you know, Sharks, I mean, or, you know, we're talking about teams that they largely don't give a crap about. And, and who's the opener? Who, who's uh, the who's Islanders the, Rangers? Islanders. Well, see so, yeah, now, uh, New York, New York, New York. Yeah, I don't think though they're gonna make like a one-time exception just because this one's Chicago. I think their general rule is we'll miss we're we're fine to miss five or ten minutes of the game 
because well, screw the West Coast. I mean, they. I mean, that's. I mean, I'm just being honest. Like that's how. No, I, I that's how that. these people think. Like they're. They're. I mean, they're. They know their money is in the East Coast game, so the West Coast game is kind of just a secondary concern. I, I I completely agree, and I get that. I'm just saying I don't understand why starting the early, or the early game a half an hour early is that big of a deal. Instead of 4.30, 4 o'clock here, instead of 7.30 there, 7 o'clock, I don't think it's that, that much of a big deal. We've seen the Sharks games get scheduled a half an hour earlier when there's something else going on. So I just, I don't see it. I don't agree with it. I understand it. I just don't agree with it. Yeah, I know you'd think, but again, like I said, it, I just think they don't give a damn. Like, that's, I, I think it's like it's such a secondary thought to them. They really don't care. And, well, that's that's kind of life of the Sharks fans. Luckily, though, um, do I, since I watch my games on the Internet, legally, mind you, legally, um, <laughs> I can take a quick journey down to uh, Mexico or something like that using my wonderful VPN and get the feed <laughs> directly before it uh, switches over. So I don't, I don't really miss much of the game. But... <laughs> Yeah, you know, a quick trip to Mexico. Anyway. Anything any, else? Any we other wa- thoughts on this game? <laughs> Anything I mean, else? Well, to, to quickly wrap, it's, a, you know, Dylan getting the game winner, which is the sign of the apocalypse. An amazing pass by Ward, I think, we, we which we didn't even touch on. Um, but Stalock does get the win, uh, even though he overcommitted. <laughs> But uh, and way, it's his fault we won. Oh wait, oh sorry. Yeah, that that too. It's his fault. Everything is blame Staylock. Uh, but yeah, so we get Chicago coming in. Already hit the record. It is rivalry night. We'll see if the Sharks coming out of a six-game roadie historic uh, does anything to help the dwindling attendance figures at SAP. I would pre- go ahead and say right now, just predicting that yes, we will in fact see a sellout because. It's amazing how championship uh, sweaters for championship teams come out of the woodwork whenever they come to town. So between that, uh, the Wednesday game where everybody has the next day off, it's the holidays, people coming into town, um, and the defending champs. Yeah, I'm going with we're uh, we're we're hanging up 17 562 on Wednesday. Now against Calgary on Saturday could be a different story, but I'm calling a sellout. And with that, I, I think we're, we're good here. So that game will be on at 7 o'clock on NBCSN. I would say probably more 7 to 15. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think it's and I think they're also letting uh, Bakes drop the puck because Randy and Bakes have the night off um, for for some weird reason. Uh, they're not having them do the game, which is weird. Really? Yeah, Randy mentioned that on the broadcast tonight. So we... I'm I'm guessing maybe Strader and Hedekin perhaps doing the game. But that but, makes uh, zero sense. I mean, when you consider all the the national games that they've done before, especially when they're hosting it in their own barn. I mean, we we saw Randy and Drew and go down and do NBCSN games for LA. AJ never figure out what NBC <laughs> is doing. Let's be real here. It's probably because Chicago is involved and they, uh, they, I give, would have... they give slightly more of a damn than usual. Like, normally they couldn't give a shit, but maybe they give a little, little tiny bit. Okay. I would I would figure that they probably have Strader and Olchuk doing the game on Wednesday. Jesus Christ, can we get a little... Is, isn't Olchuk, like, normally Chicago's color? Yes, but he's also the yeah. one of the analysts. While Pierre, well, see, they should have just had Randy do the play-by-play and Olchek do the color, and just like so. Okay, here, this is a happy medium. Yep, exactly. But uh, with it being on NBCSN, that means that we are the only post-game show in town. So make sure you subscribe down here, uh, and also you know go on, log on to technology.net where we can have. Uh, all your updates, all your info, all your game day previews, and of course, Technology After Dark will be linked in there. So you'll be able to find us then. Until then, on Wednesday night, for AJ Strong, for Chris JWS, Ian Reed, Eric Landy, Gentry Alexander, Daryl Martin, Wendell McGowan, Rocket Backhander, Felix, Randall Hahn, did I miss anybody? I hope you got them all, dude. I lost count a long time ago. Oh gosh, I think I, I think I got them all. But until then, keep it real, keep it fresh, keep it real fresh. Good night.